Hello, I'm Greg Kutsona, and welcome to On a Crash Course with the Old Testament. In these 10 weeks, you'll get an overview of the story, the overarching narrative of the Old Testament, so that you can find your story in God's story. You are invited to On a Crash Course with the Old Testament. All right, this is week four of On a Crash Course with the Old Testament, so welcome And we have a lot of material tonight. Uh, (laughs) This material was put together very carefully a few years ago by a team. And so I trust explicitly and implicitly what was done, but it is a lot of material. So you'll definitely see me emphasizing an overview, you know, the the broad strokes. And then in the time afterward, whatever we want to discuss in the more specific, uh, you know, specific chapters, let's do that. So um, we're calling this out of bondage. So the key part of this story is as the story of um, Jacob and Joseph and his brothers ends Genesis and we begin to hear about a king of Pharaoh that did not know Joseph, right? So um, quite a problem for the Israelites that get put into slavery and the, the trajectory of this is that getting out of slavery, out of bondage, they move into new promises. So I was thinking about this before we go to prayer, just a little, little quick story. Um, I remember growing up without a lot of uh, Christian training, religious training in my life. And I was over at my friend's house, Doug, and Doug came from a Jewish background and he had a book up on his shelf that said Exodus. I didn't even know what it, how to pronounce it. I was like, Doug, what is this book? What does Exodus mean? You know, and I thought, uh, I had no idea of this foundational story for the understanding of, you know, the the tradition of Judaism out of which he came. And of course, its importance for us as Christians. So, so I don't know, that's just a, it's a little bit of a, a reminder of where some of us come to these stories. Some of us have heard these stories all our lives. And the key, again, that we're trying to do here is not do all the historical work, critical work, but really get the overarching themes of this and then figure out um, where, our, where we fit in with that. So let's read from Psalm 78, verses 12 through 24. In the sight of their ancestors, God worked marvels. In the land of Egypt, in the fields of Zoan, he divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the water stand like a heap. In the daytime, he led them with a cloud, and all night long with a fiery light. He split rocks open in the wilderness and gave them drink abundantly as from the deep. He made streams come out of the rock and caused waters to flow down like rivers. This is again Psalm 78 and out of verse 17. Yet they sinned still more against him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert. They tested God in their heart, By demanding the food they craved, they spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Even though he struck the rock so that waters gushed out and torrents overflowed, can he also provide bread and meat? Sorry, can he also give give bread and provide meat for his people? Therefore, when the Lord heard he was full of rage, the fire was kindled against Jacob, his anger mounted against Israel, because they had no faith in God and did not trust his saving power. Yet... God commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Let's take a moment to pray, to ask God to bless this evening tonight. Our God, we thank you for this reminder that you provide for us. Yet even as we turn away from you, you give us provision. The theme of providence That even though there are things that are meant for our ill, that you work them for good, that is our hope. And we ask that in this grand story we read, we might find our own story as well tonight. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So, um, Exodus literally literally means in Greek, the road out. Uh, So God leads the people out of Egypt. From their bondage as brickmakers in the fields of Egypt in about the 13th century BC, according to most scholars, um, Moses that I, you know, I'm leaning on 
Moses leads the people out to the wilderness in Sinai, and they become the people called Israel. So we did see, of course, earlier this naming Jacob as Israel, but here we see the people becoming uh, the people of Israel. And, you know, I think I said it earlier in the prayer, but um, I don't, I'm not trying to do teaching and lesson, a lesson while I pray. Prayer is prayer. But I do think that one of the things that just struck me about this passage is providence or the passages. Like, you know, this guy, the idea that God provides. That there's an, and I think that's really what we're trying to do here is like, there's an overarching theme of God providing that is part of this, um, these texts. And, and you know, we're going we're gonna to see in that key scripture in, in Genesis 50, 20, where, um, you know, even though people intended to harm me, you use everything for good, God, or God uses this for good. So it's providence. There's one theme that we can draw out of all these scriptures is there's God's providing for us. All right, so as I said, lots and lots of text tonight. Let me get the, the, the ending of um, this passage. I'm going to use, again, the Bible for Dummies, which is really, really helpful, very helpful book. would highly recommend it for this, these stories because they take a, mainly a story approach to the Bible. Um, okay, so God's decision to bless Abraham, Sarah, and their descendants is not just for them. God intends that through Abraham and Sarah, Sarah's offspring, quote, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, end of quote. These promises are passed down to Abraham's son Isaac, then to Isaac's son Jacob, whose 12 sons become the progenitors of the 12 tribes of Israel. Due to a severe famine in their homeland, Jacob and his sons and their families moved to Egypt, where things go well, largely due to the reputation and influence of Jacob's son Joseph of the Technicolor <laughs> Dreamcoat fame. I think we. I think I read that last week, but it's a good reminder of where we are. So that first section we're looking at is the ending of Genesis, and um, what I would like just to pull out from that, and what we could discuss later, is the storyline of Joseph's life. Right, the multicolored tunic part. This. I don't know how we're going to interpret this, but certainly the brothers interpreted this as favoritism by his father. Um, and then you see, you know, him being cast away, picked up again. The providence of God. He becomes a a um, rise as the Bible for Dummies puts it, rising to the job top. Joseph in Egypt, like from this person who's put into slavery, he becomes, you know, a key player um, in the government. You might say in the leadership. Um, I wanted to just focus though at the end where Jacob's dying on in chapter fifty. Um, and I've already highlighted this first, but um, obviously there's uh, <laughs> Joseph's brothers are going to be a little unsure what Joseph is going to do with all his power after they, you know, he was right in his dreams and right in what he was pursuing. But um, that doesn't necessarily mean you always do things that are kind. Um, so I think I'm going to start at verse 15, the very ending of this book. Realizing that his father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, your father gave this instruction for, for he died. Save, I'm sorry to laugh, but I'm just thinking about that. Everybody's trying to work some angle, right? You know what I mean? Um, say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and wrong they did and harm you. Now, therefore, forgive the crime of your servants, the God of the God of your father. And then there's this really interesting thing. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, we are here, are your slaves. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And here's that key verse. Even though you intended to do me harm or do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. And I think, as I said, this is a really a key component of these passages that God is overseeing the creation of a people. And part of that is overseeing evil and sin that's done. We're going to keep seeing this pattern that was in the Psalm. God promises, God commands, God directs. The people rebel, the people sin. God gets mad, but in the end of the day, God accepts the repentance of the people. 
Um, that's a, just this pattern that just seems to keep going on. There's a very, that title for Israel, the one who strives with God, seems to make a lot of sense of the history. All right. As I said, we're moving fast tonight. So Exodus, every one of those chapters is so critical, and we could have read m- more of them. But you see this incredible story, right, um, of Joseph. Uh, and then, of course, Moses is the next key figure. But the incredible story is now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph, who gets worried about how numerous the Israelites are and wants to make their labor harder and harder. He's not a very good leader. <laughs> not a very nice leader, at least. Um, and you see this, this miraculous care for this baby because the Hebrew babies are said to get killed by uh, the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. And yet Moses is cared for in Pharaoh's very own house. So cr- critical for grasping it. I hope you read those passages. I want to get to Exodus 3, because this may be one of the most important passages in the whole Old Testament. Um, I've already talked about the name of God, but here it comes up in the, uh, in the Torah, the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Let's see. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm going to start at verse seven. So already the text is using the proper name for God, which we know as Yahweh. So again, when you see in most English translations, Lord like that with the small caps, that means it's, transla- it's translating the word that actually means Yahweh, um, sometimes rendered Jehovah, which is not a good way to render it, but that's a way a lot of people know. But anyway, then Yahweh, the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry and the account of the taskmasters. Therefore, I know their sufferings and have come down to deliver them from Egyptians to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land a land flowing of of milk with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Like I said, we've got a lot in these passages. So I already skipped one of the key things. This is out of a burning bush. We're getting this voice. So there's not any small thing, right? Um, The cry of the Israelites has come up to me. And I, I was joking earlier tonight that about becoming Patrick Miller, my old Testament professor at Princeton, but One of the things I will say from Patrick Miller, this great Old Testament prof, was that the key of prayer is that God hears prayers and responds. And that's what he's saying here. I heard their cry. I will send you to Pharaoh, this guy, Moses, who's in hiding at this point, you know, like trying to avoid being seen, we could say. I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of bond, out of Egypt. And again, I don't know if we talked, I think we talked this already in the different forms of the Bible, but in prophecy, the, this is like, uh, there's a stock kind of interaction. Prophets say, I'm not the one you want. That's what happens. That's, it's, just, it's just how it goes. They resist. So we should probably be cautious of anybody that wants to be a prophet today if we follow this pattern, right? He said, I will be with you, and this will be the sign for you. It is I who sent you when you brought the people out of Egypt. You shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said, if I come to the Israelites... And say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you. And they say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Because this was the, this is, it's, it's out of the stock of the ancient Near East, Near East world that you need to know the name of the God that you're serving. And God says to Moses, I am who I am. And he said further, thus shall you say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God said to Moses, thus say to the, the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. And there's more to come in this passage, but this is the central part where God reveals the divine name. The divine name meaning the one who is. That's what Yahweh means ultimately, the one who is. That God's existence, if we can even call it that, is is, is the foundation of all that uh, is in this world. Does it, and, and also that God works through history this is a really important part of understanding the revelation that's, com- that's coming here is like God is working and has made covenants. We talked about those in the previous weeks, but has worked th- in history through these people, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? It's the same God who's working this 
uh, revelation. And so then, um, you know, Moses continues to fight with God. I'm not the right person. I don't speak very well. Um, but ultimately, uh, we probably should learn that when we fight with God, there is going to be one answer at the end of the day, which is it's better to follow, right? Which he does finally get. And you then see um, this first encounter in chapter five with Pharaoh, where Moses, with all of the chutzpah possible, says, let my people go. And Pharaoh says, I, I don't really think that's going to happen. You know what I mean? And that's the context for this whole passage. I mean, I think a lot of us know this well, but all the, the back and forth and Pharaoh seems to let them go, doesn't let them go. And finally, you know, they through these different uh, plagues, as they're typically known, these different um, divine signs that Pharaoh's not doing the right thing. Finally, um, you know, God strikes down the firstborn. And here we then come to the next part of this, the night of Passover, right? So God is going to strike down the firstborn, but with the right sacrifice and the blood on the, the lintel, the doorpost, God will pass over the Hebrew babies. And uh, I want to use the Old Testament, King James here, smite the Egyptians. There's something, good, this, I don't know, I like that word smite. So that's what, uh, you know, what happens. And um, obviously, again, these passages are so rich in story. Um, and I want to make sure we take some time to discuss this. But the point, I think, for the story is that God has called Moses. The task that's before him is not easy. And then he is sent to uh, proclaim something and God stands by him. And ultimately, then we see the people of Israel, as probably everybody in this room knows, um, either in this room or in the online room, then the Israelites go out and are pursued by the army um, of the Egyptians. And um, we come to the passage which you probably should have um, you know, even read more chapters in that passage where Moses lays down the staff and parts the sea so the Israelites can pass because between uh, the Israelites are between the sea and the army, right? Between rock and a hard place and God uh, acts with clarity to show that God is the God of power by splitting the sea. Let me just say, um, this is an interesting point. I find this fascinating. Um, so the word in Hebrew for the Sea of Reeds or the sea is Yom Suf, which probably mean could also mean the Sea of Reeds. The interesting thing is that it was um, when it was translated into, into Greek in what's called the Septuagint, they called it the Red Sea. So it's hard to know exactly where this is. All this, this, this is one historical point I find interesting. The reason for this discrepancy between the Red Sea, this translation of Yom Suf in Hebrew, and the Reed Sea is that the Hebrew Bible calls this body of water Sea of Reeds, while the Greek translation of the Bible calls it the Red Sea. So many scholars believe the Bible is referring to the Red Sea or the Gulf of Suez, but some have suggested that it is referring to the, one of the many freshwater lakes with abundant reeds now covered by the Suez Canal. Either way, what happened was a miracle. And um, I don't want to get too deep into this um, because... It's going to make it sound like, well, this is just one more great story. But I will say what God is rescuing the people from is their fear of, of the sea. So the sea is always, is always fearful for the Israelites. They were not seafaring people. And the sea always represented chaos. So the ongoing um, mode, the light motif in the Bible is the sea is a problem. It's where, it's where you know, things happen that are, um, need to be controlled in this case, split so that there's safety and there's dry land. Um, and for all the seafaring folks in the world, of course, we don't want to say that God hates the ocean or something, but, but it is also important that it comes and it, it's a recurring theme of the people of Israel. So in this case, God wants them to go to the promised land as we hear this sea and the army stand between them, but God can do the work needed to make that happen. I think that's the, the key to the story. Again, really summarizing a lot, which I hope we can discuss. Let me just keep going then. So Exodus 19 uh, and 20, still in these first five books of the Bible. So it just shows we're in week four, we still need to stay in these first books because they're so important. Uh, this is again, the Torah, which means laws or instructions, um, the way we're guided. 
And here we find first what's called um, in by biblical scholars and scholars of religion, et cetera, is a theophany, theos, phanos, God appearing. And so God appears to Moses in chapter 19. And there's this particular relationship that Moses has with God that's unusual. God seems to want to work through Moses, or not even seems to, does work through Moses to speak to the people, and then gives the 10, what we know as the 10 commandments, both in Exodus 20, and then I, the other passages in Deuteronomy 5. And Deuteronomy means, by the way, uh, the second law. So you see a second giving of the law um, in Deuteronomy. That's why it's titled that in, in the Greek translation, Deuteronomy. So here's instructions that are, you know, that are really foundational for the people of Israel. And foundational in the sense that they establish, you know, a relationship with God. You know, you shall have no other gods before me. Uh, she won't make graven images, uh, establishes relationships with others, right? You shouldn't, won't bear false, shouldn't bear false witness. You shouldn't murder. Um, you shouldn't covet uh, relationships in some ways with um, the earth and creation. Even the Sabbath band that has all those things. You know, you, you rest your cattle, you rest the fields in the extension of the Sabbath law. You have a connection with God and worship. You're able to restore time with your neighbor. Um, so these really critical passages, again, really something I hope we, if we want to take some time to discuss as foundational to this God who has a moral character. There's a God, this is a God who's not just undifferentiated, you know, like it doesn't matter what happens. God has things that you really know are good and, and bad. And God is very clear that when you do those, <laughs> things go better. Um, one of the most important passages, again, that we cannot skip without reading is Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 4, because this is the uh, what's called the Shema, something pious Jews in the time of Jesus would have uh, memorized and said regularly. And to the degree that we can emphasize Jesus's human life, we can, we can assume, I think, pretty clearly that he came from a family that was very devoted to their faith as Jews and probably learned these words from his father and his mother. And here they are. Shema means hear, I mean like as in listen, but hear. Uh, let me just put a little contrast there. We tend to say see. Like if I said, I understand what you mean. I said, I see what you mean. In Hebrew, uh, in Jewish thinking, in the Hebrew Bible, it's more I hear. I hear means I understand what you're saying, I, meaning I follow it. So here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, uh, the Lord alone, or the Lord our God is one Lord, or the Lord our God, the Lord is one. There's different ways you can render that. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Sorry, all your might, excuse me. Keep these words that I have commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you rise. Find them as a sign in your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So the central uh, fundamental component of Israelite life, listen to God, the one God, obey that one God. Um, all right, just to finish off in the sections we're in, and before I go to an overall reflection question, so we have um, then Exodus 32 and 34. Here's that rebellion side. Uh, the people of Israel create a golden bull. It's probably a better word for it than calf. Um, and Aaron's, you know, in this as well, one of the leaders of Israel. So it's really more than disappointing. Uh, it's sinful, you know, it's disobedient. And then um, you have Moses speaking, God speaking to Moses, Moses, me to God, there's this incredible kind of argument, you know, and Moses says, you can't give up on the people because you're not going to look for a good as a God if you give up on your people right now. <laughs> and uh, I don't know how much humor there is in this, but I hear humor to some degree. And in addition to the seriousness, obviously, this is great. I don't want to take anything lightly about the character of God in this, that there's a holy God that's like really disappointed with the people. But at the same time, maybe there's a humorous element of like, how many times can I go through this with my, the people? It just is going to keep happening in the story, right? And 
I don't know about you, but finding my story in that story is not so hard to figure out. Um, so what do we learn about the human rebellion? Well, that it's keep, it keeps happening. Uh, why did we... What, why do you think the different characters in ancient Israel rebelled? I think those are things we're thinking about. Um, the final arc of this narrative is then we get to a point. So again, just to be clear, so the people rebel, God's about to give up on them. Moses argues with God, says, here's your character. Remember your character. God says, You're, absolutely, I'm going to stay with my people. And the covenant is re renewed, that, that agreement God has. Um, and um, I'm sorry, I'm making up my screen there. Um, so then we have um, this re uh, reconnaissance of the land that happens in, in numbers. So they've been given the command to go into the land and uh, they, they are given reconnaissance of it. They are scared about it. And um, they are given then in Numbers 14, a decision to attack and take the land that they're going to inhabit. This doesn't end the problem, but it does end this week <laughs> of getting into the land, which is the promise. The promise takes a long time to get to. Um, I want to close with just one last reading, and then let's have our discussion. Um, let's see. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into God's presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to God with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it in the dry land which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our, God, our, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And here's that rebellion theme again. Oh, today you would listen to him, do his voice. Do not harden your hearts as in Meribah, as in the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your ancestors tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years. And this is the wandering in the wilderness that I didn't even get a chance to touch on, right? Before they get to the promised land, after they've escaped from Israel, or from Egypt, excuse me, for 40 years, those 40 years of wandering, I loathe that generation and said, they are a people whose hearts go astray and they do not regard my ways. Therefore, in my anger, I swore they shall not enter my rest. So this psalm ends with the, the kind of like fearfulness of working with a God. You know, this is not necessarily a safe God. It's God who's going to get, it's good, his character is going to come out. And yet, when you read the whole book of Psalms, right? The next psalm goes right into Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. So this is the God that has the story that arcs toward salvation and toward what we would call grace, toward chesed, toward loving kindness. What are some of the key or foundational passages you read in these passages, these, this full extent of passages this week? In the storyline of the Bible, especially God's creation of the covenant of the people of Israel, and what are some of your favorite stories and why? That's what I want to talk about. Um, and as we then, you know, talk about the passages, because I think we need to spend a little time on these. They're, they're, they're pretty complicated and complex, and there's a lot of angles that obviously I didn't touch on. I also want to make sure we take in how this story then helps us to grow in our faith in Christ and what that means. So... There we have it, the providence of God, all the way from the ending of the life of Jacob through the people of Israel, having gone through uh, the Passover and walking, uh, you know, out of and the Exodus on the edge of the promised land.